welcome to our webinar reserves a pragmatic approach this is the latest charity webinar co-hosted by brown jacobson more kingston smith and quilt achieviet in this session we'll be discussing reserves what are they for what should you be doing with them are they passive or could they be proactive by way of introduction my name is catherine Rostongi. i head the charities practice at brown jacobson and i will be moderating this session today I'm joined by regular panellists, James Saunders, charity partner at Moore Kingston Smith, a specialist audit partner advising charities and educational institutions. He is also a trustee of Med Supply Drive, a governor at Rose Hill School, and a non-executive at Reach2 Multi Academy Trust. I'm also joined by Charles Mosquita, charities director at Quilt Achieviet, and a proud trustee of RL Glasspool, Bowel, Reach Bowel Research UK, and PRISM. We're also joined today by James Brooke Turner of Yoke & Co and Director of Investments at Nuffield Foundation and Bobby Dole, Director of Finance and Support Services at Martlett's Hospice. Bobby is also a volunteer non-executive director of Arch Healthcare, a GP service for the homeless in Brighton and Hove and a coach and treasurer of a Brighton Community Football Club. So the longer term impact of the pandemic has resulted in many charities reviewing the level of reserves that they have and whether they are sufficient and also their reserves policy itself. What are those reserves for? Is it an orderly winding up of the charity if needed or a more strategic use? The pandemic has definitely shown the importance of having reserves rather than being seen as money that should be spent. The Charity Commission's guidance on reserves is entitled charity reserves, building resilience. But I wonder whether resilience is the focus of many charities when they are writing their reserves policy and calculating the appropriate level of reserves for their charity. The guidance states, it is important for charities to have a policy explaining their approach to reserves. There is no single level or even a range of reserves that is right for all charities. Any target set by trustees for the level of reserves to be held or decision that there is no need for reserves should reflect the particular circumstances of the individual charity and be explained in the policy. So James Saunders, if I could start with you, what is your experience of the discussions you've had with clients concerning reserves? Yeah, thanks Catherine. Um, I'd say that um, even, even before the pandemic, uh, Certainly, clients, my clients, were looking to be much more, much more astute about their reserves policy and how they look at their reserves. I, I think that many were looking at what their reserves policy said about their charity, and in particular, what their reserve number said about their their charity. Um, you know, a reasonably long-standing concern amongst boards and management teams uh, has been that having too, too too high level of reserves may well be a disincentive for funders to give you money, whereas having too low a level of reserves may um, sort of cast doubt amongst your stakeholders in your ability to continue as a going concern. So th th there's often been a, a happy medium, if you like, on reserves, although it's never been consistent across different organisations. It does rather depend on your, your operating model and, and, and your strategic model. Uh, but I mean, more recently, I think a lot of charities, again, just before the pandemic, were, were looking at their, uh, their historical reserves policies, which traditionally would have incorporated a certain number of months of operating costs along with a, a chunk of close down costs and thinking that those policies didn't really align with the ambitions or, or the strategy of the, of the charity in question. Certainly the more financially mature and more soundly governed uh, charities were trying to bring an element of strategy and ambition and innovation into their reserves policies um, to, to reflect the fact they wanted a reserves policy to be more than just that worst case scenario. And that worst case scenario has been a, a bit of a baseline policy for a number of years. Uh, and I, I do feel that um, charity trustees and management teams both had very good reasons to try and move on from that. Uh, in, it's not just down to trustees in those cases. Many, many management teams have been very proactive in pushing their trustee boards to allow more reserves to be freed up to spend on the charity's purposes rather than just keep on hand for a rainy day or for that ultimate close down process, which in the end, no one is really aiming for or working towards or, or targeting. Yeah, and James, do you think the tone has changed over the last couple of years in relation to reserves? 
Um, I, I think it's still an evolving process in a lot of cases. I think that the change had actually been made before the pandemic. I, I think the charities before the pandemic were, were, were try, often trying to re-engineer their reserves policies. But I think the pandemic has almost certainly helped them understand what elements of those re-engineered or prospective policies work or don't work. I think in some cases it might have confirmed to charities that the rainy day planning might be overly, overly prudent and not sufficiently sensible, common sensible. Um, so, so in a slightly perverse way, I think it might have helped charities adapt to their reserves policies and shed some light on how useful they are and, and how well they're, they're acting. I, I would also say that I, I think an awful lot of charities uh, have, have always been struggling with the concept of free reserves, which is different to the, just the phrase reserves. Uh, and by that, I mean, they were struggling to find a definition of free reserves that was both consistent and useful. Um, and in the end, I do feel that the use of the term free reserves remains something of a gray area, which means oh, it's not comparable across the charity network. Uh, and where charities put it in their trustees report, in my world, and when we come, come look at the, the statutory accounts, it, it's often inconsistently applied uh, and to an extent can be made to fit a purpose which is not always entirely comparable between one in, entity and another. That's not to say that it's not a useful reporting tool and, and an analytical tool. I'm just saying it's not always consistently applied. And Bobby, I understand that your charity recently went through reserves planning process. Um, so why did you do that? What did you do? How did it go? Thanks, Catherine. Um, yes, we've we've been through a process with with our trustees. Um, I suppose the first part of your question was the why, and the, the why was uh, a general perception amongst us as a leadership team that we were tying up too much capital. Um, and, you know, in essence, the these funds were given to our hospice um, to spend for the services that we offer. So, so that was the underlying rationale as to why we did that. In, in terms of the how, um, I found the you know the Charities Commission Code 19 um, on reserves management incredibly helpful, and I'd, I'd endorse anyone to um, go and take a look at that look at that document. Um, and and what we did was actually convey some of the key points as to what CC 19 was saying, um, and and try and take our trustees on the journey of compartmentalising um, the reserves that we hold um, in terms of result what where we where we were and when we ended what, what I can say to people is that when we started we had the most linear of reserves policies uh, which was we have we will hold six months of running costs that that's it that's how simplistic it was um, now if you go through CC19 one of the things it endorses is to try and match your reserves with with some of the eventualities of the organization um, and where that ended as a result for us is splitting our reserves requirement into three components um, the first was the not so proactive discussion of simulating a shutdown if our hospice has to shut down and the charity has to shut down what costs are you trying to preserve for the organization um, in a in a sector dominated by clinical and non-clinical workforce, you know, there's a need to make sure redundancy payments can be paid. So it won't surprise you to hear that uh, redundancy uh, value of the entire organization now makes up a core part of our reserves. Um, the second element was running costs. Um, so we do still have an element of running costs, but it's important that you net some of the guaranteed income, um, you know, NHS sourced income. Um, it in part funds what hospices do. Um, and when you net that against your running costs, there, there's a net amount that you're then seeking to protect on your running costs. So that's the second part of our components of reserves. The final component um, is that magical topic of legacies. Uh, for many charities, uh, legacy is a significant source of income. Uh, and for the hospice sector, and in particular, uh, the Martlets, it's a significant um, aspect of income for us. But we are mindful that legacies do manoeuvre from one year to the next. Um, it's not a steady amount that you get from one year to the next, and there's fluctuations. So, 
what we thought was to protect against that by taking a percentage of our reserves um, as a percentage of our forecasted legacies. So if those legacies don't come in, we have some protection against that. So, so that's where we've ended up. Um, the final comment I would make is um, this didn't happen overnight. Um, I think in total, the, the process of introducing uh, the Charities Commission 19 code, taking the trustees on a journey um, and concluding uh, the segments I talked about probably took about 12 months. So um, repetition at board meetings, uh, developing the discussions, but always coming back to, you know, what were we trying to achieve, which was to release more capital to spend on the services that we could offer. Mm. Thank you. And James Brooke Turner, at Nuffield, how would that approach compare? Okay, so we're, we're, we're not, Nuffield's not an operational charity, so we're not like Bobby and we don't have um, um, buildings with people in them, things like that. We've got, we mainly make grants. And so that means that um, our system has got really good breaks. If we need to stop spending money, you can basically stop dead very quickly. Um, our problem is that if you need to start spending money, um, it really is quite hard. It takes a long time to set up a new program. And you, so you can't sort of stop and start spending. So we have different considerations. But the break part, the lack of liabilities, is really important. Um, but for us, uh, I think our concern, this is a concern I see at Yoke as well, is it's very easy to accumulate assets inadvertently. That's the thing. So you can find that um, stock markets go up and up and up, and then they go down a bit. Um, but it's people are quite cautious, trustees tend to be quite cautious and reluctant to spend. So just because the stock market has gone up, people think, well, I'll spend some of that, but I better keep some for a rainy day. So it's a lack of a target that is different. So Bobby's got really clear targets. So what we've tried to do at Nuffield uh, and now with Yoke customers is to help them work out when they've got too much money and then you can spend what you don't need. And I think that's the important thing. What makes charities charitable is what they spend, not what they keep. Um, so trying to work, having a framing mechanism um, about, about that is really important for us. Mm. And James, following on from that, so what should trustees be thinking about when they discuss what is the right level of reserves for their charity? So well, it depends what, it's exactly as you described the Charity Commission's uh, reserves policy. You work out what you think is is you're trying to do. So at Nuffield's case, we want to maintain our purchasing power indefinitely. So we want to, to spend the same amount year in, year out. Um, and so we've created an index. We've taken a particular value. We increase it by inflation every year. And if our assets are above that, then we've got more money than we thought. And if they're below that, we've got less. We can sort of an action plan depending on how far adrift we are so that's the that's the main thing but i think other things that could, are very confusing about reserves are firstly when you think about reserves do you think about them as accounting reserves in terms of solvency you know are you solvent or have you borrowed against your permanent endowments or something so it's a question of solvency or is it liquidity do you have enough cash and i think the answer to that is Liquidity is an investing question, um, whereas solvency is an accounting question, which you see in the reserves note. But they're completely different things. You can get very easily confused about that. And the second area, which I think people are often confused about, is are reserves targets or are they flaws? So if you've got a reserve policy that says, I should never have less, I need six months working capital, can you ever go below six months working capital? Whereas if I've got a target of maintaining my endowment against inflation, um, I can go below that. That's absolutely fine. And I can work back to getting there. So there are different functions, whether or not it's a target or a flaw. Those, those are the main differences for me. But I think, Thanks. but I thought also think from your perspective, James, isn't it? Because we have the same thing at Glasspool, where in fact, interestingly, it was the chief executive challenging the trustees about having too much in um, unrestricted reserves, because we've got a um, final salary pension liability. 
which we would probably been a bit conservative. So we've actually made the active decision of halving our reserves as a result of that. But, you know, to us, actually, we could have no reserves whatsoever because we have an endowment which produces an income and that's what we spend on it. We have complete discretion. So so actually, you could. You, I think you're right about the, the bottom and the floor or possibly, I don't know whether Bobby does it, is have ranges. We have, we have ranges. Um, I, when you say have no reserves, I sort of use the word reserves loosely thinking the entirety of our financial assets, because the way I think of it is uh, you're sitting on this money and trustees are the barrier, the one barrier sitting between um, the money and the beneficiaries and they have to justify why they haven't let it all go. There is also a legal duty, James, about uh, balancing today's beneficiaries with the future. I'm sure only, Catherine will give us only a... For per, only for permanent endowments. Which we are, of course. <laughs> I may move to Bobby now at this point. Um, so Bobby, I wonder your views on, on whether different stakeholders look at reserves differently. Um, Catherine, I think I think definitely they do. I'm not, I can just pick a few examples. Um, you know, in the charitable world, we, we do rely a lot on um, income generation. And just to segment too, you know, if you are applying for trusts and grants, um, you know, you're talking about some very savvy organizations and individuals that will go into your published accounts in detail. They want to know your free reserves. Um, they want to know some aspects as to what's on your balance sheet before they commit to more significant funds. If you contrast that with um, events, you know, whether it's a, a ball or whether it's a running event, um, you know, the, the, the general public at that time probably won't go into the detail of analyzing what reserves an organization has. So, so just in the income generation world, you have a contrast of two populations of people. Um, in terms of staff, the you know, staff should have a significant interest as to what reserves um, the organisation have, um, especially if that's a means of protection of uh, future employment. Um, whether they do or not is um, a different topic. I think you probably have a segmentation as to some that are interested um, and others that probably find it overly technical and it's not for them to look into the detail um, or try and understand that topic. So again, you'll, you'll have a different perception. I think what I'll conclude with is um, the leadership team and trustee debate. So the, the example I gave earlier was led by a leadership team wanting to influence a release of capital um, to make sure that we could spend that on services in the future. Um, and the trustees were guided by that advice from the leadership team and, and went on the journey with us. So um, I could probably say before that, the trustees probably were quite happy with the more conservative approach because there was a significant insurance policy, if you like, to protect the organisation. So, so I wouldn't underplay the ability of a leadership team to, to take the trustees on the journey that they'd like to do. So. Yeah, thank you. And Charles, why should charities invest their reserves? Are they not better to hold them in cash as the insurance policy that they are? I think um, with this, Catherine, that um, most charities need to segment their reserves into the short, medium and long term. So we deal with the short term. The short term really is there to sort of the oil that keeps the engine going. It's the it's it's dealing with the cash flow, which I mean James has talked about earlier. And I think operational charities, particularly, you know, that's going to be important that they've got money that sits there that they have immediate access to. So actually, for those, you're looking at the financial security of that capital asset, and then anything if you place it out on deposit, which you may do for short periods of time, it's uh, any uh, interest that you receive is a is 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 a bonus. But but it's there with the immediacy and what you do the problem comes is that of course but the very nature of reserves is that they're going to be rainy day money uh, and therefore it could be sitting there for long periods of time and just to put that into perspective you know if, if inflation runs at three percent you need to double your money every 20 25 years just to maintain its purchasing power and the problem that we all have as trustees and 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 people working for charities is that if somebody gives you a pound today when you come to spend it you want it to be worth at least that amount of money in real terms because you you know we have a moral obligation i think that if people are going to uh, generously give money that that we should be protecting that and unfortunately you know if you are looking at that you then 
um, have to look at investing in real assets, which means you've got to take some risk. But, you know, trustees should be risk aware, not risk averse, and that they should be setting a mindset. And generally, the mind, the perceived wisdom is that you would be looking to invest for, for five years. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the, the money's locked up for five years. It, you still have access to it because it's there as ready day money, but it's just a mental thing. The challenge actually comes is where you've got money that isn't used for short term, i.e. anything up to three years, uh, but it isn't long term. And unfortunately, you have to make a decision of is it long term or is it short term? Uh, because that's going to be the decision of what you do with it. Uh, and 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 where that comes into play is very much so around projects. So you could have a building project, you could be looking to re-roof, rewire, whatever it may be. And generally what happens is that those have a habit of extending out further than you'd originally anticipated. So actually, uh, a lot of the times you'd be better off investing uh, rather than uh, leave it sitting uh, effectively declining in value uh, over time. Thank you. It's interesting points, Charles. Um, James Saunders, if I come back to you, I think we still frequently see charities putting down three, six or nine months as their reserves policy in their annual reports. What is the magic number and is that the right way to approach it? Um, I, no, I, 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 mean, I, I mentioned earlier, I think Bobby also said, um, you know, that, that sort of three, six, nine months, it's, it's a bit of an outdated approach, really, a bit, bit simplistic in, in the modern days. Um, you know, Bobby, Bobby talked about the compartmentalised reserves policy that they've got at Martlets. Uh, and certainly any, any sort of um, ambition or strategy for growth or, or commitment to innovation, I think, will mean that um, forward thinking boards should be doing should, should be more than just um, planning for a fixed month close down or, you know, I've seen some really good reserves policies recently dividing up the target reserves into, um, for example, a, you know, a third close down, a third business continuity, operating continuity, and then a third of the pot for innovation and, and investment, you know, bringing in that, that strategic development. And I think the real key is to, to tie your reserves policy back to your strategy to, to understand the nature of what you're doing to understand the nature of your reserves as well, be they restricted or designated or endowments or unrestricted and work out what you want to do to implement that strategy in light of that breakdown. It's interesting, Charles and JBT had that um, just a discussion earlier about what reserves, you know, what reserves are for different charities. Actually, the Charity Commission says that reserves are the <coughs> amount that are, are, are freely available to spend on your objectives. Uh, and their calculation excludes endowments, for example, from free reserves, and, and, and in, indeed excludes any restricted funds. It effectively brings it down to unrestricted funds, less, um, less fixed assets as well. So actually the Charity Commission tightens the definition of, of what uh, it, 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 it terms reserves. Uh, and as I said earlier, it does rather than move into reserves versus free reserves versus you know, all the different classifications. So it can get a bit, a bit tricky at times. I'm going to bring in James Brooke Turner at this point, but whether you want to comment on that, James, but also post pandemic, do you think there's been a shift change in relation to reserves and, and the reason for having them? Oh, I think so. I think to pick up James's point, I think that's absolutely true. I think the language of reserves is astonishingly difficult. I think there was a time until recently when the definition in the SORP and the definition in CC19 was perhaps slightly different, which didn't help. So I think what people mean by reserves, you've got to sort out for yourself. And I, and, and I think it, in the natural sense of things, everything you have should is available for your beneficiaries, except as Charles says, for permanent endowment. And that would be a natural starting point. And, you know, maybe it doesn't change much. How has it changed? I think um, in my world, in investment-led charities, uh, the change has been quite astonishing, not so much since the pandemic, since the global financial crisis, when all the uh, central bank support to make to give cheap money to everyone um, has made charities, people with assets, if you've got assets, you've become twice as wealthy. You've had huge amounts of support. Stock markets have just gone up and up and up for the best part of 15 years now. Um, while, on the other hand, um, government support for um, our beneficiaries has been decimated, has absolutely gone through the floor. So we're in this extraordinary position where uh, 
the people with the money have got much richer and the people without it have got much poorer. Um, but that hasn't really been rectified. In theory, you, you know, if you wanted to maintain your sort of purchasing power, you might have given half your money away by now um, and been half the size. That's a very difficult thing for trustees to do. But effectively, that would reflect the reality of what's been going on. Mm. And Bobby, there's a bit of tension on this discussion, but I wonder as well, has there been a tension between the trustees and the senior management team at your charity as to what reserves are for and how much they should be? I think so, yes, is a short answer. But um, I would encourage, I mean, it's healthy tension. Um, you know, sometimes if you have the right amount of tension in a conversation, it, it drives a, a different dialogue. So I, I dare say if, if we never introduce the topic of can we move away from our linear six months reserves policy, um, I'd be sat here today with less capital that we could release to spend on some projects that we're working on. So, so that tension is healthy. I also think what is also healthy is the, the matching concept. James referred to it just then, which is, you know, you're taking trustees on a journey of what does a simulated shutdown look like? Um, what are the, the future strategic thrusts of the organisation that you want to invest into? So I think they're all highly positive discussions. So, so I'd say in this case, there is some tension, but tension is good. Good. And now for a bit of excitement, I think, as well as tension. So I'm throwing this open to James, Brook Turner and to Charles, whoever's quickest to get there first. Um, but I would question, you know, what's the public's understanding of the need for reserves? And would you suggest how that could be better explained to them? Off you go, Charles. Uh, you want me to go first? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think the, uh, the public understanding of reserves, I think, is poor, quite simply. Uh, I think most of them haven't got a clue. Um, and I think even if they did went and look at uh, uh, the report and accounts, in fact, my wife did it the other day when she was going to sign up to run the marathon, you know, and she saw this particular charity was sitting on two million in reserves. And she said, well, what's the point of me going and raising money? Why don't they spend that first and then come back and ask me to raise money? So, you know, you get and I mean, she didn't bother to have a look at the policy if there was a policy, which there was uh, in this report and accounts. But then in the other breath, she turns around and tells me that the that, that charity is getting too big and they're too professional. and They've become too commercial. Um, and, uh, you know, they're all they are is now a money making machine. So you've got sort of uh, one thing and then a, and then another. So um, I, I just wonder whether I, I mean, I think for the general pub, for the general public, I think this is that they're, they're not that interested in understanding it and therefore will continue to support. But I think there is um, uh, an opportunity from the regulator particularly to actually educate. Um, and I think it is all about um, having organizations that if you're gonna give money, so you're investing in them, you want them to be sustainable. You want to invest in a successful, in a successful operation because then that's one is gonna go out and succeed. Uh, and, and the thing I always slightly think about and I can't really sort of quite work out, but you know, if you look at a private business and you're gonna invest in the shares, you don't look at the, I mean, we do look at the cash flow, but you don't look at the reserves that they hold. You don't question them. Uh, but what you do look, look is, is that business gonna be in business tomorrow? Is it gonna be in business next year, et cetera? And do you expect it to have some financial resilience, which reserves will be part of? Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's a, a balance between what is quantitative and what is qualitative. And I think there's, there seems to be quite a lot of evidence that um, public giving is based on good narratives. The stronger your narrative, the better your brand recognition, the more successful your fundraising will be. That's not linked in any way. To the size of your reserves and if you look at the very largest charities the very largest charities they often have huge incomes and equally huge reserves and struggle to find ways for spending their monies so i think it's i i don't know what the solution is i don't know what the solution is well the other thing i mean bobby will confirm you know for fundraising or legacies are turning the tap on and off because you can't spend any more in a particular year. You, you, there, there's a certain bandwidth with that. So actually your ability to control a lot of these things is quite limited. And nor can you really go out and say, I'm deliberately going to raise less money for my charitable purpose. Yeah, because people will stop giving to you and you won't be able to turn the tap back on again when you need it. 
I was going to a charity that would run out of beneficiaries and um, just decided to invest its money in cash. Yeah, I thought, extraordinary, extraordinary decision. And Bobby, I suppose following on from that, what would your charity do if your reserves were very different from your stated policy? You know, if they were much higher or alternatively much lower, what would the response be? Um, if the um, our reserves currently are higher than our free reserves requirement, um, primarily because we've been on that journey of releasing capital. Um, but what we have a significant project on the horizon, which is rebuilding our inpatient unit um, from a building that was built way back in the 90s. So, so we know we have something significant on the horizon, a, a multi-million pound um, project that we'd like to fund from reserves and equally through a capital appeal at the same time. So, so that's something that we're working on right now. It's a very real scenario um, and we hope to commence in 2022. In terms of if we were lower, um, the again, it was a part of the journey of the, the new reserves policy, which is having the right triggers in place that you don't suddenly come to a point where you are beyond your minimum thresholds. As you approach the minimum thresholds, you have the triggers in place that engage uh, management and trustees to have the right discussion. So early warning triggers um, and then a, a, a selection of monitoring um, as you stage through those processes. Now, fortunately, we've not had to do that yet, but we're highly mindful that there may be a point in time that we do that. But as long as those early warning signs are made and the, the right discussions are put in place, we, we feel we'd be in a good place. Mm, that's good. And James Saunders, should charities be linking their reserves policy to their risk register, to their key risks? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, the, a good risk management uh, risk register is a, is a good um, management tool. Um, in the same way, you know, going back to the previous discussion about fundraising and legacies, legacies are, you know, ridiculously long term plans can come into play for for, for, for raising legacies. You know, our, our fundraising team have shown me at times um, strategic fundraising plans that they prepare for clients, and these things are designed over, you know, six, nine, twelve months in the into the future for the short term smaller grants, and then two, three, four years for longer term grants and longer term corporate strategic um, partnerships, those sort of things, and then through into 10, 15, 20 years for legacy planning. Um, you know, extremely long, long uh, term and well developed um, uh, plans that also need to be brought into uh, the reserves policy considerations. Um, I mean, and linking in with, I mean, one of the risks uh, in a risk register or one of the risks that trustees ought to be aware is, of is that, you know, have we got too high a risk or indeed, when I was talking about levels of reserves earlier, but the balance of reserves is very important between unrestricted and restricted. Again, going back to the points that all of the guys made just a minute ago, if you've got to understand your balance of reserves. You can be, you can have an awful lot of restricted reserves and still be very inflexible and that can be a risk to your operating model. If you've got lo very low levels of unrestricted uh, reserves, very high levels of restricted reserves and endowments, you know, it might well be that you just simply can't do what, you know, what your operational um, plans are. Uh, not quite um, over trading in the corporate sense, but you need to have that flexibility. Equally, if you haven't got restricted reserves and you've got a lot of unrestricted reserves, um, you, it, you may well find that you're, you, you haven't got anything to fall back on in, in the long run and, uh, and you have got too much, um, you know, too much money to play with. So it is a difficult balance, but the, the balance between the different types of reserves is, is one that ought to go in that risk register, be combined with that risk register and those strategic fundraising plans to, to formulate your reserves policy, yes. Mm. And Charles, on that question of balance, do you think charities are limiting their ability to generate funds by holding reserves? Um, I well, I think the, the, the general public know, because I don't think going back to what we've said previously, that people really look at, you know, when you're being asked to give money to support somebody to do the marathon or whatever it is, you don't go, oh, gosh, I must go and have a look at the report and accounts to see how much um, money they're sitting on. You know, you're, you're very much, so this is an emotional decision. 
uh, of when you're making that uh, that uh, thing. So um, actually, I, I I from that perspective, I don't think so. But um, I and, and funnily enough, it might be an interesting question to put to James around grant makers of of what their attitude towards reserves are because. Um, you know, he's mentioned earlier that, that, or Bobby mentioned earlier that they, you know, that they, they go and have a look and scrutiny and they're doing it intelligently. Uh, but I, I, I sometimes wonder how intelligently that is. And that may be linked into core, core cost funding and things like that of when you're actually giving money to charities. So I think that would be an illiterate, but, but fundamentally, I think that from, um, for the general public, uh, that they don't, uh, that they're not interested. Well, that's not they're not interested. They they don't look, and therefore. But if they did see a, um, significant reserves, I think that would uh, automatically the uh, give the impression that um, you know why should we give you money? Why don't spend this and then and then come and ask us for it? I think the answer to your questions, Charles, is um, it varies enormously by grant maker, as you'll know from Glasspool. Some grant makers um, will give to charities which have got enormous reserves because they're offering um, something that the grant maker really wants to encourage. And, and that's how the grant, the grant maker can only express itself through third parties. So it's limited in who it can choose. And if one third party is richer than another, but has a much better project, that's what they're going to want to do. So I think that's, that's a problem. Mm. And James, while I've got you, how often would you recommend that charities should be reviewing their reserves policy and who should be carrying out that review? Should it be led by finance team or by the board? Should it be a subcommittee? I think this, it goes back to what Bobby was saying about triggers. Um, my, my colleague at Nuffield has come up with this fabulous thing um, from the Cold War called a DEFCON table, where you have progressive series of um, nuclear submarines um, having to go raise that alert level. So he's created a table saying if you've got this much money, you're at alert level this. But if you lose that much and you're down here, you've got your maximum alert level and all the alarms are going off. So depending on where you are, it's going to, um, your different levels are going to uh, trigger a different seriousness of discussion. But that, how often you do that is linked to um, how in control of the machine you are. So if you're an endowed grant maker, you're pretty much in control of it. You can turn the tap on and off. And so, so it's it's not worrying like Bobby, where he will have different different um, things and much more acute problems. I think that, and that's the other thing. It's it's fine. Reserves are fine, and targets are fine for dealing with sudden catastrophes, particularly in the sort of endowment world, sudden market drops. But they're not very good and less well designed for dealing with much more chronic or slow burning issues like say inflation would be for us. So I think recognizing the, the short acute sort of problem and the long term burn is a different thing that should be in all reserve policies. I don't know what Bobby thinks. Bobby might be excited by the thought of uh, sirens and uh, dramatic lighting I think for DEFCON 1. <laughs> Uh, I'd rather not. We've not been down there yet, but you know, it, it may happen at a point in time. So uh, we'll get the DEF CON lighting system ready. I have to say, as a trustee, you certainly don't want to be there. I've been with one organisation where we're questioning whether it was a going concern, and that is quite scary. Yeah. So if I could come to each of you in turn, do you have any final thoughts or tips that you would like to share? James Saunders, I'm going to come to you first. I think only really reiterating uh, how much things are changing um, with, with charities. You know, clearly it had started, I think it started before the pandemic. I think trustees were, were, were far more were looking at the results far more intelligently. Um, you know, the Charity Commission is clearly uh, keen on reserves policies being uh, stated and um you know considered in the trustees report uh, that will probably only continue uh, in the in the next um iteration of the sort when it comes out in a couple of years time um but it's only common sense i think for 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 trustees and for management boards to find that balance to understand the um the reserves targets to be clever about what uh, their reserves policy and their reserve target level of reserves is 
and how it can be of use to the charity, not just uh, that Armageddon uh, worst case scenario. Yeah. And Bobby, what about your final thoughts or tips? I think the, the first and foremost is we've touched on purpose. So, you know, any charity must recognise why funds were given to their organisation to further the purposes of the charity. I'd love to think that in every situation that led to a, a pragmatic discussion on investment. Where can we invest to improve our services? Actually, where can we invest to give other charities to to help further the same purpose that they're trying to do? So that's the proactive side of things. Um, but equally, you know, I'm, I'm highly, um, re I highly recognise that there are many, many charities out there that, and I commend them, that run finances on a shoestring, or maybe they're, they're commissions to cover all their services through um, grants from, you know, councils, clinical commissioning groups, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So for them, the reserves policy will be very different. But we've talked here about matching the reserves policy to your risk register. Um, and so I think that's highly important. Do, do think about where your organisation is at and how you can match that up with your reserves policy. Thank you. And James, coming to you next. I would say, I think Bob is absolutely right. It's, it's fine talking about um, the problems of reserves when you've got plenty of them. I think the situation is completely different. And I think we've all been there where you've got no reserves and you're having to think, really what your lower lowest floor is before you sort of call it a day. I think that's a really difficult position. Uh, and you contrast that with um, what I refer to as reckless caution at the other end of the scale, where it's easy just to be too cautious. Um, and I, I mean, it reminds me, well, I gave, gave a talk to some poor Swedish students once on the difference between um, prudence and caution, if you can imagine. To which the answer is sometimes it is prudent to be incautious. But I think if you're at the other end of the scale, it's prudent to be very cautious. And I think getting that balance, understanding that balance is right at both ends, I'd, I'd say. Thank you. And Charles, final word. James, as always, has stolen my thunder because it was exactly the point I was going to get to make about <laughs> these being. Uh, some has been overly cautious and overly conservative. I, I, I think you should ask yourself the question, you know, uh, about whether the reserves are sucking the life out of the organisation. I, I really do think you should challenge yourself every year because, you know, there is a balance there between, um, you know, being prudent, but but also being entrepreneurial and being being prepared to take risks. And I, and I really worry the amount of regulation we put in, um, you know, there's a direct correlation to people wanting to be more and more risk averse. And I, and I think one of the successes, I mean, I look at the hospice movement. I mean, it's been phenomenally successful. I mean, it's a world leader in, in what it has done, but it's done because it started off at a kitchen table from a particular individual who felt passionate about a cause and they took a whole lot of risks. And we need to continue doing that uh, you know, we've seen the hospice movement move from hospice in, um, you know, within in, in, in the hospice out into the communities. And they've been really quick to react and do something which you wouldn't necessarily see from the from the NHS um, or from 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 government. And I, and, and I think we just need to go back uh, as trustees and senior management and just say to ourselves, you know, are our reserves sucking the life out of the organisation because we really should be there making a difference and taking those risks to to, to go the extra mile. Excellent. That's food for thought. Um, so we very much hope that you've enjoyed listening to this discussion today. We'd welcome any feedback or observations that you might have, and we look forward to seeing you on another webinar. Thank you. Mm -hmm.